This is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. Everybody, how are you? Hey, it's Alex. It's me. Yeah, it's uh, your old pal, Al. And uh, we're uh, we're here with the ramble. We'll be here until midnight tonight. Yes, midnight tonight, uh, Eastern Daylight Time. That's the uh, right coast of the United States. Okay, and uh, depending on where you are in the world, just adjust for that, and then you can tell whether we're live or not. And if we're not live, then you're listening to a playback on GabNet.net, just the audio. Or you're looking at the video any time of the day you want to on Facebook Live, YouTube, live stream, Vimeo, uh, anything else. I can put it over to uh, Tumblr, but some, most of the time I don't. So anyway, listen, we got a very special guest tonight, and I ain't kidding when I say a special guest, and here she is. Ladies and gentlemen, staring you straight in the face is wife number two. I guess that's the way to put it, right? Yeah, I think so. How many were have there been? Four or five? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there have been four. <laughs> four. And she's out of sync today if we're showing the picture because we have no reason to know why. She was in sync a while back, then she isn't in sync. It's the great Skype gods, but I wanted you to see her face because this is amazing, you know. Um, she's been going through some very bad health problems. I mean, things you wouldn't want to get, okay? And you look great. You look healthy. You know, it's been on July 20th when I had the surgery. And the surgery, you know, um, they opened up my torso from neck to, you know what, and did a lot of stuff inside. And it was hard to go through that recovery. But I'm 95% back. I'm not, it's it's just short of 100%. I can do, I mean, there are rules of how I have to eat now and things like that. But beyond that, I'm no different than I was before. Yeah. Um, and I'm just as surprised as everybody else and grateful. So anyway, this is, uh, this is our 52nd wedding anniversary on September 18th. Right. If, if we had stayed married. Right. We were married for how long? I can't remember now. It was about six years, something like that, seven? About six years, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, sometimes you find that the two people who are married are not meant to be married, but then later on in life they find that they were meant to be friends, you know? And um, well, Let me tell you something. And you started that. out as a friend, so why not wind up as one, you know? Well, you know what else I think is that when we are younger, I've, other people our age have, have agreed with me, that when we were younger, dating, getting married or having trial marriages or whatever they used to call those things, is that we all, men and women, had a long list of requirements in the other person. Some people want a sense of humor first or, you know, there's a long list. This age, I don't really have a long list. You either like somebody or you don't like somebody. And if there's some irritating qualities about them, how much do you, if you like them enough, you can get by with those. I don't think we had that uh, understanding yeah. uh, and tolerance when we were young. Yeah. So, I mean, you're right. Uh, uh, and also when you get older, I find marriage is different when you're older. I mean, I got married for the fourth time at uh, a late age, okay, and, and her too. And it just has different dynamics. You know, you're, you don't have the same, ex you don't expect the same thing out of it. You know, you expect the, the whole different things that you want out of it. Uh, and I think then you, I think early on you kind of marry out of, I don't know, some kind of. Lust. Well, not even lust many times, <laughs> but just what I would call one of the worst decisions you can possibly make. You know, if you if you made that, you would not have made that same decision, say, at 40 that you made at 30, not the same decision at 30 you would have made at 20. You know what I'm saying? I don't know because I only got married once. I never did it again. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm your one and only husband. I soured, yes. I soured you on the whole idea. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 
Oh man, oh man, that's that's <laughs> terrible. That's terrible. Well, I don't know where to you know where to start with you because there's so much. That's what you used to say with me. I don't know where to start with you. Um, I don't know where to start with you because there's so many aspects to your life. Number one is the current. I don't want to call it a predicament. It's the current. It is a predicament. I call it a predicament. Okay, a, the predicament. You have you have pancreatic cancer, but. Do, do they say you have pancreatic cancer or now are yes. you, don't you have it because they took it out? No, they took out half my pancreas that had the tumor in it. Yeah. And they took out a whole bunch of uh, lymph glands, 17 or 18, three of which have cancer cells. So a week from now, I start chemotherapy to try to attack those. Wow. Uh, but, but so, so they still consider you have pancreatic cancer then in that yes. case? Yes. Um, yes. And then you go through this, this well, this, what might be grueling or not grueling. You don't know. It's different with everybody. <laughs> they right? can't tell you. There's a whole long list of side effects you might get. Some people do. Some people don't. Nobody can tell you. Wow. Perhaps you. Wow. Jeez. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's really amazing um, that you, you've gone through this with such... Oh, you write about it. Let's tell people you have a, do you know you're the hardest person I've ever had to interview? I'm usually never at a loss for words when I'm interviewing somebody. Um, uh, uh, you. Uh, well, you know, we were married for 52 years, but we knew each other for seven years before that, so let's call it six. <laughs> but what happened is, is um, you have a, you have a, a blog. Uh, uh, and it's called Time Goes By. It's a time book goes by dot net. Net. Okay. Um, and I, um, uh, I really think that that you've done a marvelous job of explaining what you've been going through. If anybody wants to read it, there. And it's some of the best writing you've done, I might add, because this is something where you're talking about fear, you're talking about apprehension, you're talking about the process of going through this thing, about coming out the other side of the, of the operation and having to go to the chemo. And you're very open about it. I mean, is this a catharsis for you in a lot of ways? I mean, if you didn't have this blog, would it be a lot harder? Uh, I don't know what I do know is that the support from readers, from thousands of readers, is overwhelming, and that has helped a lot. And that until this happened to me, I was so healthy for 76 years. Uh, my primary care physician likes to say, Ronnie, you're very healthy, except for the cancer, <laughs> which is a lot like, hey, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play, uh, other than that? Exactly. Um, <laughs> but... Um, I would write, even if I didn't have a blog, I would write a lot of this for myself because I mentioned it in today's post that the writer E.M. Forster said about 100 years ago, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? And I've always used just private personal writing for that. And so in that way, it's helped me. But now I put it out there in the public and get a lot of good reaction. It's really interesting. That's great. That's terrific. Uh, but, you know, it it it, it is an interesting part of your life because you've had you've led a very interesting life all right i mean you feel your 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 life was blessed as you look back on it with just being in a lot of good situations like being married to me for instance which was a no joy. no you think that you think that's a joke that's not a joke i had a wonderful career completely unplanned didn't plan a bit of it just followed one foot after the other and it started because when you switched from being a music DJ to being a talk show host and where you were working then wouldn't give you a producer and it's damned hard to talk to people on the radio and still run a board and do all the commercials and everything so I worked with you well the other because part of it the other part of it and let me say this the other part of it her mouth's still going to the people who are watching this because we're behind <laughs> who knows how much um, uh, 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 it, it, what happened was is that I just am lousy at booking guests. I just don't know where to start. I don't have the gall to do it. You know, it takes a lot of chutzpah. And, and you were great at that. And so, you know, I had some of the great people on 
because you booked them. Well, a huge part of that is when you just started the talk show, don't forget that it was the number one talk show in town. That makes a big difference when especially big name stars, music stars came through town. They don't like to do interviews. And so they would agree with the record company, let's say, that they would do only one interview. Well, who are they going to go to? They're going to go to the guy that's got the most audience. That was you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're talking about Houston in this case, right? Yes, yeah. yes. But uh, other places, when yeah, we went to yeah. New York, too. Well, yeah. When we went to, uh, when we went to uh, Chicago, you were out of a job that way because I was just doing a music show and that was right. it. And then we went to, to, to New York. Uh, and I remember saying to you at one point, um, uh, gee, uh, you know, where else could we go? Chicago's big enough. Where else could we go? New York? And all of a sudden, I get a call and somebody wants me to, to talk to them in New York. And uh, we pick up and we go to New York and you become my producer at WMCA. And then we start having really good guests on that show. You know, <laughs> I was thought you were going to say, and then we started having real problems. <laughs> Well, that too, but you know. <laughs> but what my point was is that when we broke up, as I, you don't maybe know this, but when people ask me how, how I got into television, I said, well, I'd been producing my former husband's radio show, and when I left him, I couldn't very well show up for work the next day. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to go find another job. Yeah. And so I, you know, I produced television shows for a long time. Um, and then I got really lucky. A friend of mine at CBS back in 1995 was made executive producer of CBS TV's first news website, CBS.com, news, CBSnews.com. So I became managing editor and spent the next 10 years on the Internet when it was brand new. And the thing about that that I loved so much was that all the years I was in television, I always loved the stagehands in the studios because they had yeah. been there going, a lot of them clear back to the 1940s and 50s when TV was new. And they had all these great stories about the beginning of television. I got to be in on the beginning of the commercial internet yeah. and helped invent it. All the little things of how you see stories presented on the screen. And we didn't even have video yet in those days and we hardly had even still photos that we could put in the stories we helped invent that and we had a great time yeah. i had a wonderful career all kinds of fun things. kind of i was in on the invention of the other end of it the video end of it and the audio end of it uh because we were doing we were actually with a thing called play tv the first daily 12 hour day live um video program i remember that you know, so, I mean, uh, you were fascinated by the same thing I was, but you left a chunk out there of your career. <laughs> uh, maybe yes. maybe you want to forget it. I don't know. But when you left me, you went to work at uh, the Dick Cavett show. Uh, right? As a lowly production assistant. Right, right. And uh, I didn't think that producing the number one radio talk show in Portland, in New York, was very impressive. <laughs> no, no, uh, you, you're going to be an assistant here. Yeah, this is TV, babes. You know, it's not <laughs> but just. But I'll tell you what radio. was important about that. Yeah. If I had taken a little longer to find a job, I could have talked myself into a better television job. But I needed the money, and so I took it. And what happened was, it's not that easy to add video to what was essentially a radio talk show, but right. with video. And as a lowly assistant, I could ask all the dumb questions yeah. and learn. If I had talked myself into a better job, you would they would just to, see yeah. me as not knowing how to do the job. So it worked out okay. Yeah, yeah. So then, uh, I don't know, how did you get the job with Barbara Walters? Um, a woman that I had worked with at the Dick Cavett Show had become executive producer of the Barbara Walters specials. And I had been doing, after I left the Dick Cavett show, just some local morning shows like Kathy and Regis New York had about a half a dozen of them back in those days. And I I sometimes feel like I worked every damned one of them. Um, and I got a call from her. I'd taken the summer off just because I was tired of it. And I had just hung up the telephone. This kind of goes with what you had, the, the coincidences that happened. I had just hung up the phone from talking with a friend and I had finished by saying, you know, summer's almost over. I'm going to have to go find a job soon. And I picked up the laundry to go take it, drop it off at the laundromat down the street. And the phone rang again, and it was that woman from uh, the Dick Cavett Show who said, Ronnie, I've just become 
the executive producer at the Barbara Walter Specials, which was only a year old at that time, 1977. And she said, um, I need you to come be a producer here. <laughs> and I started on Monday. Yeah. And you lasted. And things just, I got, I've been so lucky all my life that things just fell in my and, lap. And you lasted there for how long? 12 years? 11 years. 11 years. 11 years. As the associate producer, if you look at any of those old specials, there she is, Ronnie Bennett, associate producer. Uh, and that's. Mostly, that, I, and I, I did, you know, a lot, I did all the research for all the guests, which was extensive. I mean, we just practically found every word and every uh, video that was ever shot of any of those guests. And I got to travel on ABC's dime all over the country well, that, and all, all over, the, over world. the world. Yeah. yeah. It was it was a good job. And you met some very amazing the people you met was amazing. Well, I but it was there were amazing people I met on the show on your show when I produced that too. Yeah, but you know. but a little more uh, I think a little more amazing once you got to Barbara Walters because you were you were dealing pe with people like Henry Kissinger. I think you right. talked about once. Talk, talk, who who was who was your? It's so hard to remember. I went John Way. I mean, this is back in the set, starting in the late seventies and through the eighties. So a yeah. lot of these people are dead. Oh, and by the way, one of the funny things that happened at our offices is we'd gotten still shots of Barbara. We were going. We moved into new offices and wanted to put photographs of her with everybody she'd interviewed on the show on the walls. So somebody got them framed and brought them to me, and I was laying them out against on the floor by the walls where I wanted them placed. And the, the production assistant, wonderful guy named Wayne, came to me as he was doing it that day and said, Ronnie, come and look at this. I want to be sure you want it this way. And I came, I said, yeah, and there was John Wayne, and I don't know, I can't remember the other names, but big name, as big a name as John Wayne was back in those days. And he said, Ronnie, you want all of these down here on this wall? He said, have you noticed that they're all dead? Did you mean to do it that way? <laughs> I hadn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, a lot of people that, I remember doing Dolly Parton, and... Um, Early, early, that was one of the earliest ones. Um, we, King Hussein of Jordan. Um, we did Sean Connery in the south of Spain at his home there. And I love the south of Spain so much, I had some time, so I spent another two or three weeks there before I came home. Yeah. Um, it, uh, it, well, you know, it, it's so hard to go back and remember. Yeah. Um, Is there any one of those people you remember particularly because you liked them? You always remember the ones you didn't like. You know? Okay, name a few you didn't like. <laughs> no, that couple is still alive. I don't want to well, say that. Don't, name the ones who are dead. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I mean, one that was really wonderful that doesn't, it, he's, uh, he is dead. Um, James Garner. Uh, who is, you know, a mid-level actor, always easygoing kind of guy, not a brilliant actor, but not a terrible actor, nicest person in the whole world. And the thing he wanted to do, we were shooting at his house in Los Angeles, was, and it had these gigantic, big, heavy, wooden two doors, you know, that open like this. And he spent a long time, all of us, anybody he was chatting with while we were doing set up during the day, that I made them rehang these doors again and again and again until you could close them by just pushing them with your finger. <laughs> and that's what he cared most about about his house. Um, and it, I, I wish you, I wish I knew you were going to ask this question because that was then, and this is now, you know. Yeah. And I just forget unless something yeah. comes up. Um, How was John Wayne as a person? Um, nice. Yeah. You know, okay. Um, Ronald Reagan, in his first year in office, we did at his ranch in California. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we talked about, after we were done with the shoot, we talked about that, that he was most comfortable. He w didn't like much of the interview at all. He didn't really want to do it, although he was being polite. But whenever there was a break or during setups, he would go talk to the crew and he would tell Hollywood stories from 20, 30, 40 years ago. And he knew incredible detail about them. But he, And there was a big budget crisis in Washington while he was at the ranch in California. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he wasn't nearly as engaged talking about government things 
as he was talking about old Hollywood. Yeah. And we talked about that afterwards and thought that it was the strangest thing, how much he was engaged with that, how much he remembered that, how much he wanted to tell stories, but not talk about being president. I mean, being president, wouldn't you want to talk about being president? You know? Yeah, yeah. He was more interested in Hollywood stories. <laughs> well, that's amazing. That's amazing. So you've had this. You had a. You had a really amazing career there, and uh, as what happens with all careers, I can I can attest to it. They start going in a different direction. They start going in less dramatic, and I think a lot of it has to do with age. I, I you know, your your specialty is age. Uh, on my and, blog, yes. On your blog. And, and I think, and, and I've talked about it many times on my show, that uh, aging suddenly makes you, puts you into a category where you're discounted, you know? Absolutely, no it's matter, called ageism. No matter and what your ability. And abilities. it's widespread and it's yeah. everywhere. I, my last paying job, I was working for a website, at mostly younger people, but that's how websites were, especially the techies are always much younger. Mm -hmm. And one day about, 10 or 12 of us got laid off. My younger colleagues were finding new jobs in six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks. Yeah. In a year, I only could get two interviews. Some They would like me on the telephone and then I'd show up and all of a sudden the job had been filled overnight. Yeah. And until I finally had to, that's why I left New York. I finally had to sell my apartment because that's where all my money was and yeah. go somewhere else to live. Right. Um, and that's the people who were laid off, the millions of them, who were laid off during the 2008 market crash, um, most of them, most of them, I don't remember the percentages right now, never again, even in their 40s and 50s, never again worked in their field or never again made as much money as they'd been making when they were fired. And this is, there's, there's as you get older and you begin to look older, there's an invisible line. None of us know where it is or, and it comes at a different age for everybody. But you step across that line and exactly what you said the whole world on every level discounts you. You you don't it, whatever you were any good at before. They don't remember that. They don't care. Um, we become invisible. I mean, women have always talked about how after fifty or so you're invisible to the rest of the world. But men become so too. Maybe maybe you get a few more years out of it than we do. But um, you know, it's it's it doesn't change. I've been ranting on about it for the almost 15, 16, 17 years I've been doing the blog, and it doesn't change. And uh, I I consider it a a calling to remind everybody about this. Um, well, you know so something. I'll tell you. While I write about uh, it, but uh, yeah, I'll the outside world it doesn't yeah. change much. I'll tell you what happens with me. I mean, like I would love to do a radio show. I would love to, in spite of the fact that I know that radio is a business that hardly exists anymore, really, uh, I, I would love to be on the radio. But I, I've given up all hope of that because, and I haven't gone out for jobs because I know when they look at me, it's like I'm from outer space. I think you once described go walking into somebody at, an, at uh, Human Resources or something for a job, and you said the person sitting on the other side of the desk was like 30, and you looked at you like you were a Martian. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, a 30-year-old that doesn't know how to deal with an employee that he or she, to whom the, the employee reports, if they're old and if they look like their mother, or these days their grandmother in my case, yeah. and, um, and they don't know how to deal with that, um, or you, you can't it's just that you don't see your mother as an employee you can't you know psychologically you don't deal with that but um but it's in all kinds of other areas that uh, are affected by ageism old people do not get the best health care because people think that oh she's old oh he's old it must be a stroke when it's something it can be dehydration that's making you sound like you had a stroke things yeah. like that happen Right, but all I'm saying is that when it comes to the job market, forget it, you know? Right. I mean, yes. you know, at 77 years of age, I just don't think anybody will hire me. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think I You know, I, I always am. thought that people in radio were safe because no, no matter how much people don't want to hire people because they look old, nobody in the audience knows how old you are. Hey, listen, you, uh, your voice doesn't sound that much different now than it did uh, years ago, and I don't think my voice is that much different, is it? it is, it's not, no. Yeah, yeah. 
then you were perfectly in sync. How do you like that? Towards, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. You know, you know yeah. it's just I, I think you're dealing. You, you, what you're dealing with on uh, TimeGoesBy.net is valuable, very valuable, and you're the only one I think that's speaking towards that topic in such a uh, such an important way. I mean, you really serve the. I hate to use the word elder or senior or whatever. Movie, no, no, no. There's but. real language you should know about. Senior is old and dusty and nobody likes it okay, anymore. Okay, all right. And it's short for I senior that. citizen that was always awful. I like elder a lot. And there are such, there are elder law attorneys. And um, there are uh, elder departments at a few of the states in the United States rather than senior departments, you know, for handling those issues. Um, elder is good and I like old. I really, I don't like older because it sounds like you're trying to pretend you're younger than you are. Yeah, my wife says I'm that. I'm an old person. My, Nothing wrong with that. My wife says that. I said, we're getting old. And she says, no, we're getting older. And I go, eh. Now, tell her to you know. go with old. I mean, I have to tell you, the first time, early, early on, I made the decision that I would refer to old people as old and as elders. And I had, everybody, you grow up. Say, learning to speak about old people a certain way and nobody questions it but now I was questioning it because I really was I saw myself becoming an advocate for old people so the first time I wrote the word old person it was really hard <laughs> oh, I'm really gonna put that out there on the internet where the whole world might read it and I did and it, Every time I needed to use the word old, elder didn't bother me because I think it's a fairly elegant word, but old bothered me. And after about two weeks, you've done it enough times, it's just normal. I, I and that's why I tell people like your wife, use the word old, use the word elder, because before long, it will be as normal as calling a little kid a little kid, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it just becomes easy to say once you've done it a few times. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I just, uh, uh, um, uh, I don't mind being old i mean i turned around the other day and looked and said i'm 77 years old god that's old but the i don't mind being old i just mind all the aches and pains that go with it you know all i mean i've got this little thing wrong and that i mean talking to you i shouldn't even uh, complain about it but oh, it, I, but no, you know, i wrote about that the other day because a lot of my readers had said well my problem compared to yours isn't a big deal at all every problem is a big deal Every problem. If you're is. facing pain and, every day, and it's, and and it's a crapshoot, yeah. none of us knows what's going to happen to us. Right. And and some people, you know, a few people get to the grave without anything big deal happening. Most of us are what you're talking about. The, there's this twinge here. Is it important? Should I look into it or not? Um, or creaky, creaky well, joints. Well, the worst I'm part about it is I'm a you know, you, you know me. I'm a hypochondriac. So anything. You, you know. mean you never got over that? No, never, never. It's worse now that I'm older than when I was younger. <laughs> oh, God. It, it just, I'm glad it's Marjorie that has to hear it instead of me. Yeah, well, she hates it. She hates it. She, and she's not very nurturing in that. <laughs> but, plus the fact that going to a doctor is her hobby. She has all these doctor's appointments she goes to regularly, you know. I mean, uh, uh, the insurance company's getting a hater. So, you know. But, you know, there's so much to talk to you about and, and right now so little time. I would love to do this more, you know, because what you have to say about aging and what you have to say about uh, just life in general is refreshing. Absolutely refreshing. Oh, you're very kind. I just, I mean, one of the things I tried, particularly since this cancer began, um, I wasn't, I, I, I wondered if I was going to write about it at all on the blog. And then I realized it was taking up so much of my brain space that there probably wasn't going to be a blog unless I... I wrote about it. And then I, too, I realized that whether mine is pancreatic cancer, someone else has very bad arthritis, someone else has diabetes they're trying to manage, and so on. Um, it's the nature of old age that you get something, and many old people have several conditions or diseases they're trying to juggle. So my, the subtitle of my blog is what it's really like to get old. And I'd never addressed this problem of all of the medical things we live with because I got lucky. I was so healthy until three months right, ago. Right, right. Uh, so, so it is part of getting old. And, and a lot of my readers, a huge number, are way ahead of me of how hard it is to make the best of, of, the, uh, of the limitations that various things you have give you and still 
be as healthy and do all the things you want to do as you possibly can every day. So I think that's a, that's a reasonably good topic for a blog about getting old. I think so, too. And I've got to say, I'll tell you this right now. I've done a lot of interviews in my time. You're one of the best. Okay. Well, I couldn't remember anybody who've interviewed, and there were hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it's 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 funny. I was talking to somebody about Marcel Marceau the other day, and then I remembered I had interviewed him, and this was a guy who knew Marcel quite well. And uh, he did he his, actually speak? Well, no, what's or funny is, is in his apartment he had a poster for Marcel Marceau at Carnegie Hall, and that was the reason why Marcel Marceau was on my show to plug the Carnegie Hall gig. Uh huh. So life comes around. You know, comes around. Anyway, but did he speak? Oh yeah, of course. I did an interview with him. Oh, well, I remember. I, I, maybe I you remember were what he joke I, of I, what he said to me that was very flattering. Although I, maybe it's not flattering, I don't know. Is he at at the, when the interview was over? with looked at me and said, "Do you know you look like a young Albert Einstein?" <laughs> Except, well, you got to take the hat off because Einstein never wore a cap like that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, see, now I think you look like, what's the name of the guy that does that cable show? Um, oh, jeez. This is another part of old age. Um, he, he was a writer, comedy writer, and now he was, he's was he been doing his own show for about the last five or six years. Yeah. Sorry, can't I, make it come to mind. I don't know. Um, anyway. All, you, you find that memory, losing memory is another thing? It's fat. It's the things that don't come to mind are names. And by yeah. the way, as soon as we turn this off, it will come to me. Oh, of course. Um, also, I often think that when I'm going to the market, let's say, oh, there's only three things I need. I don't need to write them down. I get home with two things, not and can't remember what the third was until I need it. Um, and certain facts, numbers, I don't remember well. But other than that, um, I do pretty well. Yeah. You do yeah. great. Hey, listen, can we can we do this again? I know that you're going to be coming up on chemotherapy, and that's not going to be an easy go. <laughs> Can't wait to see what that's but about. But <laughs> once you see how that is, and of course I'll talk to you uh, on the phone about that, uh, maybe you can see your way clear to do more of this, because I really love sure. talking to you. Sure, maybe I'll get better at it. <laughs> it, it no, you're terrific at it. Ladies and gentlemen, my ex-wife, wife number two, Ronnie Bennett. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. We'll talk later. This is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. And that's my, uh, that's wife number two. Um, sorry for the, um, the fact that it wasn't uh, uh, in sync, but there was something with Skype that day, and I've had it happen with Will Durst, too, stuff that goes out to the other coast. Uh, next time I do that, I'm going to uh, reboot the machine and everything. It might have something to do with CPU performance or what. I don't know. I'm so tired of all this technology. I'm tired of just having to deal with it. Now today I had to deal with more technology. I'll talk about that, but I'm going to open up the line so people can call me and we can talk and, and do things like that. And, you know, Ronnie might be listening, so if you're... Uh, if you're uh, uh, gonna call, uh, you know, uh, be on your best behavior because uh, uh, I, uh, I need to, uh, uh, I need to, <laughs> I, I need to impress her, okay, with what we do here, our little, our little dog and pony show. Um, but uh, what, what? Oh, okay. We are not here. Please, please, you on the air. I don't know what that is exactly. Oh, oh, that, oh, that's an old, uh, yeah, okay, here comes, here comes Mike, Mike's the first one in. Uh, he, hey, how you doing? Yeah. Uh, I, so I saw the interview with your uh, your ex-wife, yeah. that was excellent. Yeah, she's terrific. And, oh, uh, God, she had a lot of information. Yeah, she's a, she's a good interview, is what she yeah. is. Yeah, so I, uh, I and, and I'm hoping that we get to do it again real soon because I I think it it's it, it, she's just great at it and I've talked to her about maybe even if she's up to it you know she's going going to go through something pretty grueling soon yeah and uh, you know we don't know yet how she's going to react to it physically and uh, so there's a good question as, as to whether she will be able to uh, uh, do much stuff like this after she starts it. On the other hand, 
she said some people do chemotherapy and it's like a walk in the park you know so we don't know yet and we'll we'll find out uh but uh i wish her the best you know yeah i do too yeah um and it, it, she's uh, she's just uh, terrific let me see here comes here comes rob alfano hello rob wait a minute is he there there he is hello rob hey alex how are you man in the dark yeah. Backlit. <laughs> hmm? Backlit. Backlit. There's more, there's more light behind me than in front of me. <laughs> That's my oh, light. Well, that was a wonderful, wonderful interview. The, I think so. She uh, she is uh, so regal looking, very, still very yes, attractive. Yes. You know, and, it, she, and it, so well spoken and uh, wow. It's interesting it. that I, I'm glad you said that because as I was looking at it, and the reason I ran the video, even though it was out of sync, is I wanted people to see her physically, okay? Uh, she looks better today than any time I remember her in her life, okay? You know, uh, uh, if you go on, onto her site, she has pictures of her at all these different ages. And I've got to tell you, she looks better right now than she's ever looked in her entire life. Wow. Uh, uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And if she's listening, you can take that to the bank, dear. And I'm not doing it because I don't want to pay alimony. That was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My dad, uh, when he had the the um, uh, pancreatic cancer, did extremely well with very little impact on him when it was time to do the chemo. Really? Yeah. Very little. I mean little bit of nausea here and there but really didn't even lose his hair maybe you get worried about that though because then you figure it isn't working you know? <laughs> no it actually worked for a very long time my father my father screwed himself um against the, he, he they found out you know when you go for something like that and they're finding out and they mm -hmm. did a complete body scan on him right. and they found that he had in addition to this pancreatic cancer that he had a um uh, an aneurysm in his uh in his uh, aorta, yeah, and that freaked him out so much. And the doctor said, "What are you, what are you getting freaked out about? It, you know, at your age." So what happened was he was getting better and better, and 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 his markers were getting better, and the tumor was getting smaller, and all of this was going on. And then he got to a point where he said, "I wanted, I'm strong enough. I want to do the operation." And the doctors advised him against it. He had to stop his treatments and all that. And he did it. He did the operation. They put a, they they fixed his uh, uh, his aneurysm. Mm -hmm. But when he had to go back to the chemo, by then his he he just didn't uh, respond to it the same anymore. Yeah, yeah. So he shouldn't have stopped. Right. Well, you know. Um, uh, so I mean, I, I I was talking to her about the fact that this went so well that I would really like to do something on a regular basis with her, even maybe do a little show with her. And and call her, and then she could, I could just kind of be, you know, the sidekick, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, in order to facilitate it. But I, but well, we may do something, uh, you know. But I, I want to make sure, her health is the most important thing. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Phil. Hey. Yeah. So did you hear my hey, wife, Alex. my ex-wife? Yeah. Huh? yeah. I yeah I listened to it. Yeah, I, very good. I, I think Marjorie would like me to refer to her as my ex-wife, and she would like me to refer to her as my <laughs> as my ex-wife. You know, so. Uh, now my mother, she had breast cancer, mm -hmm. and they had they, uh, she had the breast removed, took the chemo, mm -hmm. she lost her hair. She says, "Oh, the hell with it! I'll just get a wig." When her hair came back curly, she goes, "Hey, this is easy. All I gotta do is just wash it real quick. Just plop, plop, plop." The hair came back normal, and she's still, she's still kicking. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just when she got the curly hair, she goes, "Oh, this is easy now. Just do a quick hair job, and that's it. Don't have to worry about nothing." Yeah. Her hair came back real super curly. She goes, "I wish I had this curly hair when I was a kid. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> Not now." <laughs> yeah. But oh, she used to hate the wig, so. Yeah. Anyway. She had it. But she had an April Kabor wig, so it's too hot, wrong color. Really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, she used to complain about that, but she all of us tired to sit there and laugh at her. 
Yeah. <coughs> anyway, so, you know, hey, I... Alex. Uh, yes, Tim. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was great. And I, we, we should all thank you and her both for your service. Because what you guys do is very important well, to our country. Yeah. Or for as, I as, lo that. as long as I continue to do it. Yeah. Uh, they should have never interviewed Kissinger, but that, other than that... Great well, service. Well, Kiss Kissinger is very interesting. I, I went to a Commonwealth Club uh, thing with Kissinger. And, Al Capone uh, is interesting, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I, I do have an answer to something she said, because she said, we we don't become invisible. Men don't become invisible till later in life. Mm -hmm. But we don't live as long either. So we kind of become invisible and then we die. Tim, you're invisible on every every one of the shows. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't. It's know. working. My cloaking is working, Phil. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I saw some of your photographs. They look very good. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Which ones? Uh, uh, the uh, from the, uh, the rock the rock band. Ah, oh, thanks. Look very professional. You do a great job. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I I do a better job there than I do on the radio, huh? <laughs> But I don't know. We're still yeah, like, we're, you we're you still, still, you, you, still you, listen. You, you still lay carpet like nobody's business. You know. Yeah. You're, you yeah. Can, with, the, you can, with the tack and the hammer, right? You can do car carpeting with the best of them. Yeah, absolutely. How many? How many? How many, how many million square miles of carpeting is going to need to be be replaced after uh, the hurricane? Uh, well, you know that's uh, the uh, insurance companies are working overtime on that. I had a call State Farm today for one reason or another for one of my clients. And they had a special thing for uh, Hurricane Harvey Press One. <laughs> oh, jeez! <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's not looking good because we have Jose coming. Did was Jose born at the exact moment that Trump decided to kick DACA? I think country? he's a dreamer. Yeah. Uh, and and now he changed. And then once the hurricane popped up. Ivanka convinced him, uh, you got to change it, Dad. You can't do that. I, some of these people are my friends. You, you know, I uh, I think that... Uh, I think she came I'm back from vacation a, about a half an hour before that late night, for the, before that tweet where you reversed his policy. Well, you know, now that Trump has become a Democrat, uh, you know, I like Trump more than I like the Republicans. I, so. I, was saying to, I was saying to my wife that very morning that, you know, don't worry about tr whether Trump's going to run or not. He's definitely going to run, but as a Democrat. But... <laughs> You know, George Well said today he's going to run as an independent. So he's not quite there yet. But well, I, I don't think he's going to be in any shape to run physically. Nah, okay. Nah. I, I, no. I, yeah. This I, is this is the only the only uh, his only uh, thing at the presidency. Yeah. Uh, the only question is not, is whether Pence will be in any shape to run legally. I don't Pence. I don't think Pence wants to run. Oh, I think he does. I think. He does. I think. Look, any political animal. In Washington, and he's one of those political animals. He's raised more money in a pack than any other, any other yeah. vice president uh, in history. Uh, that's the, that's what you want to be. That's what you grew. You know, that's what you've been doing all this shit for in the first place is to be a president. Oh, yeah. You know, well, it'd be funny because he couldn't. They wouldn't reelect him governor of Indiana, a very conservative state. Yet he's going to end up being president, unfortunately. Yeah. No, I don't think so. But I don't think the Democrats but have it. The, the trick is, though, you'll have to have Pelosi as the vice president. That <laughs> or Chuck Sumer. Because we're all one big, we're a big happy family now, Phil. You're going to have to uh, get used to it. Yeah. Well, uh, hey, uh, Trump is referring to uh, Pelosi by uh, the, the first name. Now he calls her Nancy. You know. Huh. You know, you know maybe he read his Bible. <laughs> No. That's possible. Hey. Somebody got him to read the Bible. I don't know. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, I can't say that I'm disappointed that Trump has suddenly made nice, nice with the Democrats, you know, uh, because because said. because if, if he finds any kind of solace with them, uh, he will probably change his opinion to fit the, uh, the well, to fit the suit, you know, uh, well, and, and wants to win. It, it, he was getting too much negative news coverage. That's what made him change his uh, mind. He just he just said, "Look, we can't delay this aid," and uh, uh, he said he didn't want any partisan infighting. And so he said, "I'm just cutting a deal." Yeah. And if you don't like it, tough but he's shit. also you know, kind of, he, like what he's he also changing his mind about DACA too. 
I don't right, think he ever it, had changed his mind about DACA. No, he was forced to make this decision by Sessions, who said when those lawsuits hit in two weeks, he wouldn't support the lawsuits from the states, and that the DACA would die because we would lose the lawsuit. So it was Sessions who decided to, to do away with DACA. Yeah, but giving That's he said, wrong. look, there's six months. Send it to send it to Congress. Uh, if Congress can't do something in six months, he'll revisit it. You know, right, and but before I, he was going to let it die, but right. he changed it 24 hours later. And, 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 and maybe he's uh, maybe no, he's no, a human. He was it's always not. going to say he he never said he was going to let it die. He said he was going to kill it so that it went back to Congress. No, but, Congress, but if you were if you were a dreamer, it, you would have to assume it's going to die. Well, you can right. you you know what happens when you assume, right? Who well, do you make? You, know what when you don't assume, you get carried but, off. By the, no, no, by the no. eye. Hey, I got. I do have a suggestion for my congressman. All these, they're they're doing some big ice raids this week, according to news reports. Are we really? Are we really getting into politics? And are we really the, getting into the, politics this early in the show? Uh, no, what? what? You want to wait? Huh? Well, we, we just got through with a half hour of my wife talking about some very important things about old people and about uh, you know. Yeah. And, and, and yet, yet here comes here comes Tim with his usual political bent, and we're off to the races. To, and and this shit is getting to bore the fuck out of me. You know, and, and you shouldn't talk about Jeff like that. I'm not talking about <laughs> Jeff like that. <laughs> By the way, best clearest picture of the night goes to Jeff. Oh yeah, really? Oh, that's that's like uh, that's high def. That's that's oh. yeah. Your pacemaker may be giving you additional uh, 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 strength uh, there. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, my other problem is I haven't got a clock sitting in front of me tonight. For some reason, it didn't, when I rebooted it, it didn't. It's 51 minutes after. Yeah. You, you give me time signals. Anyway, right. wait, so I, um, uh, oh, 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 so the cable people came today and replaced my whole system with the new system. Uh, Was it good? Huh? Uh, yes, it, yes. It except in the in the bedroom, my set uh, is over scanning, and I don't know that it hasn't been over scanning for a while. And What's over scanning? I, and I, it, over scanning that you know, uh, it it, it blow, uh, the picture. Some of the stuff is outside the picture. You know, it it blows. Oh, it it's out not fitting. It, well, no, it's fit to sixteen by nine. But yeah. I looked up and I and I thought I had done it when I was trying to set it and see if we could get it working. Uh, but they say if you set your set to just scan, that gives you the whole picture. So I'm gonna tomorrow morning. I girlfriend was giving me a bad time because she was trying to watch tennis and I was trying to fix the TV set so she could see the whole tennis game, the whole tennis well, match. Instead, she was seeing, you know. The sides well, were cut I, off. I had some computer issues today at work. <clears throat> I, I'm trying to print out an estimate. The customer's calling me, says, I need the estimate, I need the estimate. And uh, so I keep pressing print, and it keeps going to error, uh, you know, when, when you look at it. So I called my IT people, and they get on the thing, and he does a bunch of little things. And he says, uh, is, is, is your cable plugged into the, uh, to the uh, printer, uh, you know, the USB cable? I said, yeah, it's got to be plugged into the printer. It's in a thing. It's it's covered by something else. There's, there's no way it can't be plugged in. I opened it up. The plug was out. <laughs> I plugged it in, and it, all, it worked. You ever hear of PEBCAC? Uh, no, what's that? It's an acronym. Problem exists between keyboard and what is it? Between person and keyboard or something like that. Oh, I only we know. Used to, we used I know to use RTFM. that. Yeah. You know what? RTFM? Yeah. <laughs> well, this this new system they put in. What happened to Tim? Uh, well, we, no. We stopped He's talking kind of about back in a half hour when Trump. Uh, yeah, when talk we start starts. talking about Trump again. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's uh, Trump talk at the top of the hour. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I just it was just a little too early to get into all of that. You know. Yeah. I mean, I, I it, it, and it, it it's just. Uh, and I. I get goaded, you know, as soon as I'm goaded, I'm, I'm right in there. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know, I know. But and I'm not blaming you, Tim, but, you know, I mean. He's blaming me. <laughs> I hate to be off to the races. And, you know, I'd like to, plus, I mean, I did have a really good discussion. But let me finish with what I was saying about the, the 
and stuff computer. here. So outside of that, all the other TV sets are working perfectly. And I noticed they're all on Just Scan, so I've got it. I thought I had set it to Just Scan, but I guess it didn't take or something. But anyway, if girlfriend is listening, I'm sorry that I was doing that last night. But, you know, I can't stand to not have things work. And I was trying to get you a better picture for the tennis, so I'm sorry, and I apologize to the world. But anyway, they came in, and they replaced the system that had been installed a week ago, because this guy, when he sold me the whole thing, didn't say, hey, would you like the extended box? I mean, don't you try to upsell people? You know? You're supposed to. Yeah, but he didn't upsell me. He that makes a dissatisfied customer yes. when they don't let you know what's and, available. And, and by the way, with all this installation, it's cost me a hundred bucks to install, but it's only going up five bucks a month for this new well, system. Advertise the hundred bucks over a couple of years, then yeah. it's more than five bucks a month. I would call these bastards and say, "Look, uh, no, I did, her, I did. Her, her I, people shouldn't have charged you a hundred bucks because I they should have offered it in the first place." I did, Phil. Especially, I did. Have you ever you, tried to talk to lackeys today who have no? individual ability to make a decision and just say yeah oh, just you call customer service you know at, at you amazon them, and don't Am go back at, to my at, old what, people what, what, oh yeah like i'm uh, i've got well, it's I, just I, a threat i've got a two-year deal with these people uh, you got 30 days to no, change I don't. your mind no, no i don't no what, where'd you what, see there were 30 days to change your mind no, on you files? Feel that you've been misled you are misled and no, no, uh, no, but anyway, I don't want to go back to the other people. I know you don't want to. Overall, go back. Still... I gotta say that FiOS is yeah. incredibly better now that I've got everything working. Is incredibly better than anything that stupid cable company could offer me. Okay, yeah. uh, 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 the speed on the bandwidth is just absolutely amazing, and the picture you get is terrific. But here's what this system is: the DVR does the whole thing. Okay, and they give you a cable box, and I wish I could show it to you. I don't know. It can. It can let me see here. Let me. Uh, let me. Let me just uh, uh, go into my uh, full screen here for a second and see if you if people can see it. Uh, over there. Over. Uh, over. Over there. Okay. Let me. Let me go over to the box and show you the box. This is the cable box. Can you mm. see it? Yeah. 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 That's the cable box. That's it. It's tiny. It's amazingly small. And um, uh, it, it, but the boxes do nothing. But I can now with this system, you know, with the old system, you had these boxes, and the only one that you could pause were the DVRs. I can pause these. I can even roll the picture back as far mm. as I can go, to, you know. Uh, it, it, it has all those features, and I can, I can set it to record from any, anywhere. The reason being that these boxes are basically satellites of the DVR. And the DVR, which is in the bedroom, controls the whole thing. If I change settings and the DVR changes settings on all the boxes, uh, wow. And uh, if I, uh, it, it, it's really, it's really incredible. It, it's an amazing system. Yeah, yeah. For, for Jeff had his hand up first. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Well, turn on your you, mic now, Jeff. <laughs> I always keep it off. Yeah. So it doesn't get uh, yeah. annoyed. But um, I, th I think you ought to get a job working for them, selling how much you love their product. Well, I mean, I, I, it, it, to, be, it, to begin with, this whole idea that uh, here's what happens. Here's the downside. If I were to, say, kill the power to the DVR, all the boxes would quit showing a picture on the screen. Oh. In other words, it controls everything, okay? It's not an independent receiver. Inside, it's got six tuners. Uh, so you can record six programs at once. Uh, but here's what he told me. If I'm in one room watching one channel, she's in another room watching another channel, now you can only record four channels. <laughs> because every time somebody's using up a tuner, do you, you know this, uh, do you know this, uh, Rob, have you heard this thing about these, uh, these new yeah. systems? Yeah. Yeah. 
you only have X amount of tuners and you could use them either recording or you could be watching six different TVs. And if you are, yeah. you're not recording anything. Right. Exactly. So uh, uh, that's the that's the story. You know, and, I caught huh? I caught Comcast lying today and and hoisted them by their petard. Uh, what happened was they've been stalling me off on the installation at the store for the Comcast uh, uh, cable uh, for uh, Internet. Mm -hmm. They're telling me that the city is, is holding up the permit process. So I called a guy I know in the city who happens to be way up there, and I said, hey, can you, you know, this is the address. Can you get the permit through? He says, no problem. So he calls me, that was, uh, that was Monday, he calls me back today, and he says, hey, Comcast doesn't have a permit in with the city. And so I, we call back Comcast, and, we, and they give us the same thing. Well, we're waiting for the city. And, I, and so I had my manager do it, and he says, you don't have an application with that city uh, for this address. Uh, and... Uh, and they said, well, uh, they said, well, you know, these things take a long time. He says, no, if if you put the application in and give us the number, it'll be approved in one day. And, he's, and so, you know, because of the guy I know. And so, uh, you know, what we found out is that they've been telling us that the city is holding up the application process, and they never even applied for one. I've been waiting since June. Really? So, okay. yeah, because well, they uh, have to uh, dig uh, uh, 44 feet. This is one of the most boring stories I've ever heard. Well, hey, I caught the cable company no, lying to is, me, and I was able to uh, to yeah. challenge them on it and show them yeah, that they the couldn't get away with it. the story surrounding it is uh, so uh, mind-killing. <laughs> yeah. Well, then maybe I need a uh, rim shot. No. Oh, no. Oh, don't do that. Don't oh, it's, do that. It's one minute past the hour. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, I, you know, Tim, if you want to call back, we will be talking about politics soon. You know, uh, yeah, uh, on the fifteens. But he he was just going to, to going to war tonight, right? That's what he lives for. That's what he you lives know? for, and I don't mind it. I think it's a, it adds to the program. But geez, give us an hour without this shit, you know? Well, I I don't know how he spends his entire day looking stuff up. You you know you you see these guys with the tin foil on the hats and and all of that stuff. And his whole well, life not, is consumed yeah. by I, Trump. I, I think and, the only thing that I know he does for sure is is he jerks off to Rachel Maddow. But that, beside that, that's a know, waste of time. That's a waste. <laughs> oh, that's a waste of time. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> she's not playing on the same team, uh, right? Uh, yeah. She, yeah, she's hitting for a different league. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh boy, how you doing, Patrick? I haven't talked to you much tonight. I'm doing all right. Yeah, what did you think of my my wife, ex-wife? Um, I got I got to tell you that she's somebody that people should really listen to and take note of how to handle a situation that is seemingly so daunting that you can't <coughs> really and she done it so well. You mean like you, Patrick? <laughs> no, I wouldn't put myself. In uh, you that know category. something, Patrick? Though I, no, I would put you in that same category, yeah, I would. Patrick, because I, you've taken an adversity and you laugh at it. You know, you you don't let it get the better of you. You know, and I mean, it, it, she's. You know, I I'm going through nothing. Okay, I don't have any. You know, I got a bad leg and a few little things here and there. I don't have anything like that. I don't know how I would handle that. Well, my favorite, I, I have to say, my very favorite part of that interview mm -hmm. is when you admitted to her you're still a hypochondriac, and she was surprised by that. That, that I guess yeah. I laughed yeah. when I heard that. And she said, you, you, you're still that way? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was right when I said, I'm worse. I'm worse. You know, yeah. I mean, I think I think I think um, Marjorie's going to divorce me. I really do, because I mean, it's just driving her crazy. What yeah. ailment? What's the ailment du jour? 
Oh, uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, esophageal cancer, I think I have. <laughs> I, I, the guy who owns the carpet one store about 20 miles from me, yeah. three weeks ago, dead, esophageal cancer. Yeah, really? And, Thank you yeah. very much for that. <laughs> I, I no. really appreciate it. You really know how to handle a hypochondriac. And, and it only took him a few weeks to die. Uh, he didn't know, and then all of a sudden, boom, within a few weeks, he was dead. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't know? He didn't know. What? And he, this guy used to run marathons. That has nothing to do with good health. No. I swear to you. Anybody that tells you that running and jumping and doing all of that is good for your health, it's, it's bullshit. It's or jogging. Huh? 49 years old, boom. You know, the, the runner. 49 years old? Was he 39 or 49? Come I don't know. He's your friend. No, he wasn't. This guy's the uh, uh, guy. We were talking about other guys who die who run. Jim Fix was like the guru of running. This is maybe 20 years ago, and uh, he died. He was either 39 or 49, and uh, uh, he, he died. I'll look him up. Uh, you know, you don't remember who Jim Fix was? I remember Jim Fix, of course. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, he Jim Fix wasn't a friend of mine. The other guy was. He did a he did a a book called Jim Fix on running, yeah, and everybody considered him color. him the guru of running, yeah, and uh, you know um, one day he just dropped dead of a heart attack and everybody went what that shouldn't have happened yeah he was, he was Jim young. Fix you know so but uh, yeah my uh, friend Bob uh, three weeks ago boom dead. Okay, well, thank you, uh, because... Yeah, uh, that's, you can enjoy that yeah, esophageal yeah. cancer story. No, so I've been having, like, you know... Uh, uh, little, uh, now it's indigestion, uh, I hope. Well, <laughs> uh, not pain in my chest, just kind of like... Agile. Heartburn? No it, feel, no, it doesn't even feel like heartburn, and I know it's not my heart, okay? Are, are you eating something different now that no, you didn't No, I past? just think it's anxiety. I think it yeah. is purely anxiety. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and today I just, I just felt crappy today, you know, but anyway, you know, I mean, someday, I mean, here's what's happened. Okay. In my, in my life, this is, this is where I am emotionally. Okay. And, and Jeff will laugh at me for this because Jeff also is another guy who faces adversity, I think very well, you know, uh, it's called faking it. Well, I don't know that if not faced with some adversity, I would do handle it well. I don't know that. I just know that right now I'm screaming about imaginary illnesses, okay? But that I am 77 years old, and I feel like the Grim Reaper is just standing in back of me every day of my life, you know? And, and I'm 77, and I'm saying to myself, uh, what is it that's going to kill me? You know, what, what is it the, the little chest thing I got here? Or is it the cough? Or is it the, you know, what is it? And It'll probably be old age. <laughs> well, you know, I'm praying for Alzheimer's. And here's why. Because uh, you don't want that. No, because then you won't know what's around you. And when you finally die, you don't even know you're dead. Nah, you, you don't know. I mean, uh, that, that's, that's got to be a, a, an awful way to live. Plus, you know, plus. I, I would rather die than have Alzheimer's. Really? Yeah. What are you sitting there? You're drooling for a couple of years and then you die. You know, you got to mm -hmm. have people wipe, you, wipe your mouth, your ass. Nah. I wouldn't yeah. mind drooling. You know, that'd be pretty good. Yeah, it's well, it's the cleanup part, you know, and, you, you know, you're laying there in your own shit and waiting for somebody to clean you up. Yeah. Because, uh, and you don't even know it, you know. You know, it was weird Well, my grandmother got sick and she was getting ready to pass away, she would go into it like she had dementia. Like she would talk about stories from Italy and then she wouldn't know who I am and then she would come back and know who you are like, you know, she was going back and forth like. So that's kind of strange too, the dementia. Like she would, then I asked my mother, she, is that a true story? She says, yeah, some of it was true. She said, I don't remember the other part though. She, she, she was kind of like performing different things though. But then she would know who you are and then she would drift again. When my ex's grandmother, a few months before she died, she, she lived to be 100, and she was able to recite stories about when she was a child, like, yeah, right. like it was oh, yesterday. Oh, no, but that's not uncommon. What is, no. Why that's did they do that? Uncommon. She did that. That's not uncommon. It, it is it, long-term memory, memory of things in the past. 
yeah. are things you retain and things that happened just five minutes ago you don't remember. Right, exactly. Okay. Uh, I mean, my mother was that way. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, old people are always storytellers. And the reason they're storytellers is because that's their, their memory of those things they remember. You know, I, I mean, I found it easier when I was doing my <laughs> life history, my um, oral history, to remember things that happened to me when I was a teenager than what happened to me when I was at Sirius XM. You yeah. know, uh, the closer I got to the present day, it was harder for me to remember stuff. But, you know, I remember all kinds of stories about when I was a kid. Hey, welcome yeah. to the wonderful world of, of, Alzi aging. of Alzheimer's. So when you get older, it's kind of amazing. So when you get older, you remember more of your past than when you were younger. No, well, no, you, you've always remembered your past, but that's the part you remember lucidly. Okay. You know, you know I, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. My mother, 100 years old, right? I'm, I, I have to go to New York because I've got, a, I've got a job here. So I told her, Mom, I'm going to New York. I'll be back in a few weeks. She wouldn't know the difference. And she said, oh, well, when you're in New York, say hello to my parents. Mm -hmm. Drop by and see my parents. And my immediate reaction was, Mom, your parents have been dead for years. And she says, they're dead. And she went into hysterics. Oh, no. yeah. That's it. She went, mm -hmm. and I said, I'm never doing that again. Yeah, I'll go see your parents, okay? Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, my grandmother was telling stories when she was from Naples before when she was moved before she came over here, and now what's true? Well, that those are true. She's mentioning names, but they passed away, like uh, cousins or aunts and stuff like that. Yeah. But she it was weird. I said, "Mom, what is she talking about?" She's she's telling stories when she was young, and it was she was accurate with certain things, and certain things my mother didn't really remember because she was probably too small to remember everything. Yeah, it was kind of strange. Yeah, do you remember? But then, she, uh, face, but then yeah. she would know who you were and just be in the present. Then. Alex, do you remember a thing called Lottie's Fountain uh, in San Francisco? Uh, that's that uh, fountain where the uh, survivors of the er of the '06 earthquake would gather every year. Uh, my ex-wife's grandmother was the twelfth uh, remaining. Uh, which when she died, there was only twelve before her that would gather at this fountain every year. Uh, you know, yeah. the same day that they had the earthquake, and uh, and now there are none. You know, uh, but um, you know that was uh, that was a real mark in history. You know, because uh, she was born in 1895, oh. and so she would have been uh, what 11 when the uh, when the earthquake uh, happened in 06. I imagine. Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah. So that that was a you know pretty interesting thing that Lottie yeah. Fountain is a. Uh, is this is this fountain that uh, they use to um, uh, commemorate the 06 earthquake in San Francisco? Wow! Wow! Yes, Jeff. How how old was your uh, your dad before he died? My father was 59. Oh, Yeah, he died of a pituitary tumor. Uh, <laughs> at uh, at at your hospital, uh, Phil. Um, Kaiser. Kaiser. <laughs> Kaiser? Yeah. 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 Did uh, they have one in Marin? Huh? Did they have one in Marin back then? No, no. This was, he was Freshman? in the San Francisco Kaiser. And oh, then okay. right across the street from Kaiser was the funeral home. So, you know, it was convenient. Oh. It was no stop shopping. Yeah. Uh, but my father got a pituitary tumor. Now, the pituitary is equidistant. If you Everybody can see me now without a cap, and I don't care. Um, now, now you, the only reason I wear a cap is so you can tell the difference between me and, and Patrick. Anyway, um, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you draw a line here and here, where they intersect is wh where the pituitary is, okay? In the yeah. Impossible to operate on when he was... At it, that point. At yeah. that point. Uh, it, you know, because they said, we can go in there, we can try and get the tumor out, off the pituitary, and he was in dire pain. I mean, he had a headache, massive headache. And uh, they said, but then we might cut away half his brain. We don't know. It's very risky surgery. And he died before they could make a decision on that. Uh, a few years later, uh, I was going out with a woman. And 
we had a, we were having a nice time, and in just in, as a matter of a part of discussion you have with somebody that you're dating, uh, she said, "Well, you know, a couple of years ago I was really sick," and I said, "Oh, what'd you have?" She said, "I had a pituitary tumor." <laughs> wow! And mm -hmm. I immediately went. Mm. You, I said, "You mm -hmm. had a pituitary tumor, and you're still here?" She says, "Oh, today it's nothing. They go in through the roof of your mouth." And they can get right to the pituitary tumor. They found a way to operate on it. And now it's uh, just a common procedure, and they do away with the tumor, and you're okay. My well, father and I, was and I know, the... But I swore. I mean, I was just swearing up and down. If my father had only decided to it's... get this like 10 years down the line, he'd still time. be alive today, you know. Well, my father was one of the first 100 to ever have bypass surgery. And uh, he had it in March of 72. Well, he lived about 10 days past the operation. Well, you've told this he before. Blood clots. You've hmm? told this before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, uh, the, you know, the idea was but that every time it's every time it's different, Phil. Every time it's different. Well, no, it's it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, they didn't have the clotting medicines. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, oh, it's 15 past the hour. Uh, <laughs> and... <laughs> So, now it's, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know now they do, and now that operation is just such a uh, a you know they, they do it. It's like a tonsillectomy. Uh, P, I I know a, a woman that had a triple bypass a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. She was out in four days, yeah. and now she's home. You know, and uh, no no issues whatsoever. Yeah, and you know, and whereas uh, you know in 1972 it wasn't the same. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess it's the same thing with your pituitary uh, tumor on your dad as yeah. in comparison to what they well, were doing well, today. Well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Jeff here is a is a product of modern medicine. Had he gotten what he had, uh, what, 20 years ago, Phil, uh, Jeff, would you say? Oh, longer than that. No, no, but no. Uh, uh, well, no, he had an operation, Jeff, right? When did you f first discover uh, your issues? Well, he had a stroke. I have I was like 30 years old, and I and I had a valve replacement, uh, yeah, which is open. Uh, what year was that? Um, I would say 40 years ago. So you pretty well, you pretty well had congenital heart problems. In, yeah. In your yeah. life, I mean, there was always one heart problem after another. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, plus a stroke and, and other things like that. Yeah, and then Which, he, but now so, he has a pacemaker and all of that. These things were not available just a few right. years well, ago. Sure. You know, it, it was you know it was only ten, <clears throat> approximately ten years after my father had a bypass that you had a bypass, uh, and you know, and it was uh, not anywhere near the uh, the issue that it was in '72. Well, it's just like uh, heart transplants. Uh, you remember when the first heart transplant patient, you know, Christian if the Martin. guy lived six months, it was a success. Uh, yeah. And and now it's a common procedure. I mean, if you mm -hmm. can find the heart, but you just call Brian. You know, <laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll stash one for you in the back of the truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of those are, are now done uh, without open heart surgery. They're, d they're done through catheterization. Oh, really? So to be done for less time and with less risks and, and all of that. Um, the, the big difficulties is you got to take all these drugs. Yeah. Why did you and say it was 15 minutes? Why did you say, it, wait a minute, wait a minute. Phil, why a couple minutes ago did you say it was 15 minutes past the hour? It's not 15 minutes 15 past. 15 cans in French. 15. Right. It's now 18 minutes past now the hour. 18, right. Right. How come it says, wait a minute, where, oh, I'm looking at the gigabytes. Uh, let me see here. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah, it's 11.18. See, I mean, I've, I've got all these small little clocks I have to look at here. I see. Instead well, of my know, nice big right one. Here. That's huh? my job, and I'm doing it well. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, what were you going to say about your situation? Oh, well, when they remove my prostate in a couple of months, uh, they're, they're going in and they use uh, robotics. Uh, so, you know... They, they they say that there's uh, much less chance of uh, any other issues taking place 
when they do it that way. Well, it's or any other school. issues, what do they mean by any other issues, like peeing your pants uh, and things bladder, like that? Yeah, bladder incontinence and, you know, uh, uh, you know other, other <clears throat> kinds of things that can happen, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But, mm. you know, so how, uh, how long uh, are you, have you talked? Uh, do you have a date planned on that? Uh, they, they, uh, they said that they are going to apply for a date. So they'll get back to me when the, when the date, you know, when they have some dates available. Yeah. The the uh, urologist said it's a very popular operation. <laughs> I said, oh, that's great. Yeah. It's not popular with me. <laughs> I'm yeah. not looking forward to it. Yeah. So uh, you're clear of, uh, of of the margins. In other words, you you're, you that, this thing is not spread at all. Uh, it hasn't spread into the bone. Uh, so um, and that they said was the next place it goes. Yeah. Okay. Well, and that's good. How was yeah. how would you you were worried about a bone scan whether it hurt or not? It didn't hurt, right? Doesn't hurt at all. No, it's just uh, you know people told me that oh yeah it hurts. They inject you with this dye. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I I put my arm out. See, I, I, I love people in. who when you're going to go have a procedure start telling you how horrible that procedure is. Yeah, well the cystoscopy I'm not looking forward oh, the, oh, to. Oh, cystoscopy is uh, well I had two of them so by the when i had the second one it wasn't as bad as the first the first yeah, one he brain. gave me an infection really yeah he did he I, you know i think he just spit on it to clean it first <laughs> <laughs> i just got done taking cipro because i thought i had a uh, prostate infection and uh based on some other things so uh i got cipro i just got done how did you uh, get cipro did your doctor give it to you Yes. Oh, okay. uh, my nutritionist recommended it. I told my doctor what she had discovered Cipro's through the blood test. Cipro's terrible, tests. though. Cipro's I know. Terrible. And uh, so she said, you know, Cipro, that, it works on the prostate. And uh, so when I told the doctor uh, what she had discovered, he says, well, it's pretty good. <laughs> so they descri uh, they prescribed it. Yeah. But anyway, I, uh, you know, I mean, the fact is that, uh, um, yeah, it, it is one of the more popular operations as you get older i mean prostate yeah. cancer is pretty common i mean uh, i suspect i will have prostate cancer eventually if i yeah, if i have such a, a low psa huh? oh. get to be a certain well i have age. a low psa but it went up a full point the last time so i'm going to take another one in about six a uh, couple well about a month from now uh yeah. but you know still it's it's getting it's, larger hmm? otherwise you wouldn't have the bhp uh, symptoms. Uh, well, I don't have the BHP symptoms. But don't you have to urinate a lot? No, I take medicine for that. Right, oh, but it, but you, I under, okay, you don't have the symptoms because you take the medicine. Right. But your prostate got larger, well, and that's why you he had said to my take prostate the medicine. Was, my prostate was pretty much the right size. But I don't know. You know, look, look. As you get older, your PSA goes up. They they say that. Uh, uh, it's 2.5 if you're in your 30s. It's 4 if you're in your 60s. And once you hit about 75, you can go as high as 6 before they start worrying. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm well within that range unless that year jump. I mean, and I could have jumped in that one, and then next time they take it, it it's lower again. You know, Could have been an infection just like I think I had. Well, in any event, the point I'm making is is that if you live if you're a male and you live long enough, you you'll probably get prostate cancer. But it's not aggressive prostate cancer and they just keep a wait and watch and look and see what happens. In your case, they uh uh what did they find out when they did the biopsy? They find some? Yeah. Yeah, they they found some, but they said it was in the very early stage, and it was uh, they used something called the Gleason scale, right? And and the Gleason scale, yeah. And if it's too high, and away you go. Oh, to the moon! <laughs> uh, so the uh, if you're a Gleason two, they don't even oh, consider that cancer. Yeah. Uh, Gleason that three, which is what I have, they said okay, it's just over the line. Yeah. So anyway, so, I don't know. I don't know. My mate, my mate, go up. He he just he just said in six months, let's just look at it again, and make sure it just isn't 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 going up rapidly. He said, you know, uh, he, but he wasn't that worried about it. And then he said, if it does go up, we'll do a. a, a he he doesn't stick his finger up your ass. He does everything but the sonograms, and huh. he said he put a sonic probe in there and just look around, you know, and that's fine with me, you know. Jeff was saying something, and I was saying but something. But the cystoscopy at the same time. I had, right? Yeah. 
And uh, the first time he actually gave me an infection. I had to I had to call him and tell him I'm in, I'm sick. And he said, Well, I guess you have an infection. Because uh, usually after they do that, they give you some antibiotics for like a day or two to kind of you know in case. Yeah. But it, that that wasn't enough. Uh, the second time they did it, I knew what was coming, so I was ready for it. And it wasn't as grueling as the first time. But I'm, I'm going to tell them if there's a way they can put me out or give me something that, you know, is like a local put me out for a few hours kind of thing. Well, I don't understand about putting you out why they don't. Yes, Patrick. You're talking about hospital? Yeah, yeah. You know they put linocaine on. In you, right? Yeah. They they first they they put they take a, yeah. a, a syringe kind of like uh, and put it in your dick and give you a uh, it deadens sure. the whole area. That, that, yeah. Now I realize I'm paralyzed and I get this done yearly. This is just part of my yearly urology thing. But yeah. the thing is, the linocaine really it numbs everything. And like Alex was saying, the second time around wasn't it bad you feel more pressure than anything right yeah it is pain it just it pressure and it, it because you're expanding the urethra yeah and you're going into the bladder and, and so it isn't painful um that's probably why they don't give you any local stuff because it, yeah. it's not a necessity because yeah. there's no real pain in it. Hold, hold on a second. Yeah. Hold on a second. Oh yeah, I, I, I agree with you with that. <laughs> uh, Diane Weeks just tried to call. Uh, I don't see her number here. I thought I'd give her. I'd try to call her back, but uh, I don't. I don't see her having called here, and she did just called. Well, Diane, I, I don't know why. Oh wait a minute. Here, here we got more. People, here we go. Diane Weeks. Hold on a second. Let me, let me uh, uh, see if I can call her, and get her on the, on the pipe. Because it'd be nice to have a woman in this group, uh, especially a nurse. Yeah, she's a nurse. Um, and he, here are a bunch of old people talking about their health. How's your health been, Rob? Yeah, I don't know. I don't even like this discussion. Oh, really? No. Well, yeah, because. Uh, just I'm I'm a hypochondriac too. Oh oh good. Well, you know, you can compare notes. Well, nah. or, or we can give each other imaginary. I suffer in silence. We can give yeah. each other imaginary <laughs> diseases. I guess uh, I guess we can't get Diane on the line. Well, okay, Diane. I tried. Yeah, I tried. I don't I don't know why she's having trouble. Anyway, uh, uh, no. What we you know. Um, uh, we can. Uh, yeah, I can call you sometime, Rob. We come up with imaginary diseases. You know, um, I don't know why all my life I have terrorized myself with hypochondria. You know, you get sick, you go do something about it. Here comes Diane again. Let's see if we got her this time. Hello, Diane. Are you there? There we go. We're about to get a picture, I hope, of Diane. GW. Well, are you there, Diane? Uh, yeah, I think I tried it on my phone, so I think Okay, I okay, but would you do me a favor? Turn your phone sideways. Oh, okay. Uh, that way we get the wide picture. Otherwise, we get that terrible thing. I can't stand it when people take pictures in that portrait <laughs> mode. Yeah. Pet peeve. Look at the fence post, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pet peeve. Oh, okay, there I am. I'm, it's funny, I've got it on my iPad, too. What, what, compe what compelled you to call? Well, I was listening to uh, Phil t and talking. I had to correct him. I know Phil has a w his own way of pronouncing things, but <laughs> this one I couldn't. I couldn't let this one go. He right. was talking about his BHP. B <laughs> yeah. What well, is it? BHT. It's BPH. BPH. <laughs> benign yeah. hypertro a uh, benign prostate hypertrophy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, BPH. You just say. It's, it's easy it's for you to say, yeah, right. Now, you get that because you have an enlarged prostate, right? No, you get that right. because that's the closest gas station, something. the BHP <laughs> station. Uh, <laughs> I know it sounds like a gas station. BHP. Yeah, yeah. yeah benign. Well, benign. Well, that's this is, you, uh, you know, I got to tell you, Diane, I, you know, as you know, I became an atheist. And the reason I became an atheist 
uh, uh, among other things, was I figured if there was truly a God, there wouldn't be ISIS. If there was truly a God, there wouldn't be all these people hating each other in the world or being wouldn't so... Wouldn't Jehovah's Witnesses either. It, uh, <laughs> and, and there wouldn't be cable companies. Uh, but uh, uh, I, the re first time I realized there was no God was when I found out about my prostate and that I was having a hard time peeing, and I was peeing a lot. You know, I was waking up uh, five times a night, right, to take a pee. Yeah, sounds uh, about right. Yeah, it sounds about right. And uh, I said, uh, this is no good, and then I went and looked into it, and the reason is, of course, the prostate is this gland, which uh, supplies uh, what we call uh, the fluid that the sperm swims in. Is that the best yeah. way of describing yeah. it? Or as we used to call it, the guys used to call it pre-cum. You know, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, so it's needed. It's forty for, minutes for, for, past the hour. What? What? It's forty minutes past the hour. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're gonna have to call him Big Phil. No, but anyway, uh, and and so then I found out the reason why you have all these problems is because it is in a place. It is a donut-shaped. Uh, uh, it's around, around wait a minute yeah wait a minute hold on a second what? the size of about a walnut and what goes through it what it surrounds is the urethra which is where your pee goes through right okay or where it used to go through with uh, patrick where does it go now patrick do you, you, it still does it uses a catheter oh use a catheter right right but it, it don't come out of the bladder i put it in the urethra oh. killed it it just it's an extension of the urethra it's really what it is yeah I just grab it and stab it every time I want to. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Anyway, anyway. That's so, a good way to describe so, it. So it's what like, happens is as the prostate gets larger, it presses down on the urethra and then makes it harder for you to pee. Your stream gets weak. You have to pee more often because you don't completely empty your bladder. And I said, God designed this. And if he designed this, this badly, he ain't my God, you know. Or God, or God could be a woman. Could be a woman and did it because to piss. If Nay was hearing this conversation, she would have uh, she would have corrected you. The human body <laughs> is a perfect example of perfect engineering. I mean, when you think about it, you know what your body is capable of doing and where everything is and how it all works and how it all works with each other. If it comes out perfectly out of the womb. You've got yourself really a marvel of engineering, except for the prostate. <laughs> yes. Except for the goddamn yes. prostate. No. And that has worried me all my life and given me a bad time all my life. Uh, and I, I think maybe it was because I like sex so much. I don't know. Well, uh, that's not what it is. But, <laughs> but Diane, what, what can a man do to have good prostate health if they started early? Uh, what, what causes this stuff? You know, I, I mean, I don't know what caused it. it does, I know nothing, I got causes, it, nothing causes it to enlarge. It just enlarges because of age. No, there's, yeah. there's got to be. It's a normal like, process, yeah. Really? Yeah. Too many couldn't stay the same size. Yeah. Well, there's things you can take, you know, the, the Proscare and um, to, uh, what's the other one? Oh, there's the two that we always get. Proscare is the one. Can't think of the other one. Is that like a vitamin? Do no, you give, it's a drug. Do you give oh. that? Do you give that as a as a pro prophylactic, or is it once the prostate is? Uh, I think is already I think they get symptoms of once the, the PS that uh, PS number goes up and. Yes, I I, I'm not sure exactly because I've never worked with that closely with urology, but um, prosecure, yeah, prosecure, not as much as the. Oh, I can't think of the other one. It starts with a oh. T. I'll tell oh. you. I'll tell you what's what. that stuff you take, Alex? It starts with that finasteride. Finasteride, and then, but I also yeah. take. I also take uh, Cialis. Cialis. Uh, yeah, I'm taking the Cialis five milligrams. Yeah, that right. helps. That helps. But the reason it helps is a. Uh, what is it? There's a what, what's what is the, what's that pill I used to take, that it does the same thing. What it does is it, Flomax. Flomax, yeah. It yeah. it it Flomax, uh, that's it one. it, the it makes the Wait, prostate a little worse. more it, cushiony. Uh, generic version is Tamsusilosin. Tam, tam, that's tam, what I mean. a Generic name, yeah. 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 Well, that is somehow Cialis has that it, that thing with it, and it's become very popular because over over uh, what was the other one? Uh, the other 
boner oh, pill. The other sex one? The other um, boner blue pill. Blue one. Uh, 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 Viagra. Viagra. Because Viagra doesn't do that. And so you can take it if you got BPH, and if you and if you're not if you're having problem getting hard ons, it helps on that too, you know. Yeah, but you got to use the twenty milligram for the hard ons. No, you can get no. I get a twenty. I get I, with a five milligram. I get a good decent boner. I I don't really? want to. If you want me to show you, I can just get it up for you. Uh, you you're not doing Midnight Blue anymore. <laughs> By the way, I found uh, on a porn site, believe it or not, a Midnight Blue res retrospective that was done by the guy who bought all the tapes. He, he, yeah. thinks, he thinks he's got the rights to them, but he doesn't. You know, and there's so many problems. Because, uh, I mean, even this thing has copyrighted music on it that we used in those days, you know. And uh, Anyway, I was watching it last night. I interviewed people I don't even remember interviewing. You know, oh, and I, I often said when it came to Midnight Blue, you never really saw me on that show. Bullshit. I, I'm on this tape throughout the whole thing. So I'm thinking of making kind of like a sample of it, maybe running it here one night. And... Uh, uh Fuck nice. this! Fuck this guy! Let him sue me, you know. Actually, he can't sue me because you I. You ought to he, write him and ask him for no, payment. No, actually, he he told me, I told yeah. him that when I met up with him, he he bought what he did is he got uh, Al Goldstein when he was down and out, right? Yeah. And my friend uh, Steve Gruberg and I wanted to buy all the Midnight Blue tapes from him. Uh, and he didn't sell them to us, so we were going to give him a good price. We were, we were ready to give him 10, 15 grand, something like that, right? Instead, he sells it to this guy for $5,000, you know? And then the guy starts putting out these tapes with me on them. So I got a hold of him, and I said, uh, do you have a, re a release on me? And he said, well, no. I said, then take me off of those tapes. He said, what do you want? I said, what I want is a right to, the rights to any of those tapes for my own use. And he said, okay, I'll do that. You got it. I'll write you a, a legal letter to that effect. And I never, ever got it. Okay? But basically, he admitted that, you know, he didn't have, they don't have model releases on any of the people that were in it. Because uh, somehow they, somebody you didn't think when they, when, they bought the, when they bought the tapes they yeah. didn't say, hey, where are the releases for this stuff? And the releases, I think, got thrown out with tons of other stuff when uh, Screw Magazine got re repossessed, you know, when the sheriff came by. So uh, he got the tapes out fast enough. The releases, they were maybe in a you know, filing cabinet somewhere that they threw away. Well, if you don't have the releases, the only thing you can assume is the people who signed the releases would actually feel, well, they had signed the releases and uh, uh, they must have them somewhere. You or know, they're they, dead. Yeah. Uh, y y yes, Mike. You still have the copyright, am I correct? Uh, there is no, it, it, to begin with, on this thing, it says copyright 2005 by Blues something or another. And the fact is, yeah, he can maybe copyright the configuration, but he can't copyright the material. Uh, the material wasn't ever, ever copywritten, although we did put copyright and then the year on everything, which holds a copyright in place until you actually file for the copyright. Which How you, many years does a, is a copyright good for Yeah, on that type of media? Copyrights now are good as... I don't know. I'd have to ask Shecky. He's very good at this. The life of I think of the, it's fifty years. I think really? it's more that than that. I think that, is it's it fifty no, years it's or not 50 a years past it's the not, life of the creator. Patent. It's 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 yeah, the life of the creator. So many years plus the life of the, uh, the life of the creator. Uh, it used to be flat, twenty six years. Yeah, twenty six years, and you could renew it for another twenty six. That was the way it used to be. And then they changed it around. Uh, and in those days, you know, copyrights, you, you played loosey-goosey with copyrights. You know, oh, so it's so nice that, uh, you know, you've got it uh, copywritten. That's terrific. We're, we're so happy for you. Um, however, we're still going to play your music on the back of some naked people running and lying around and playing. Because nobody ever sued you for, the, for playing stuff in those days. Today, with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, you know, it's all... 
Oh. You know, you, you uh, just can't just, this, I, I, I can't, and, I, years ago I would have played music on this show. Okay. Yeah. Well, this, the, there's a friend of uh, Mike Allen's that uh, called me up one night and said, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm doing this live thing. So he plays music and I asked him, um, you know, do you have any issues, you know, playing this music over Facebook? And he says uh, only uh, once or twice they uh, they wrote him something and said that that music was uh, such and such an artist and, and so forth. And uh, uh, he, he said that was basically the balance of his trouble, uh, that they identified it. I, I don't know where it goes from there, but... Uh, <laughs> Now he claims that if he just says that he's playing this song, that that's good enough. But I don't think it is. Yes, uh, uh, Tony. I, I, I can add something to this. You might find interesting. You're talking about, like, copyrights and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't know if this might pertain to it, but I'm reading a book on uh, the creator of the fantasy game Rome, uh, Dungeons and & Dragons and War Games. And the guy who created it was another guy. In their first, they were trying to build, like, a campaign world. They actually took... Uh, inspiration from uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. So they actually took parts of Middle Earth and placed it in their world they were creating. Mm -hmm. And the, whoever owned the rights, I guess Tolkien's family owned the rights to, of course, the father's work, they sued them right away. They would, So they just put it in the world, Alex. They didn't think anything of using it, they were saying. And well, then they well I'm saying that in those days, for instance, if I had a, a what we call our video centerfold and there was a woman rolling around on a bed somewhere naked, uh, I would then use music that i just used and nobody ever complained about it nobody ever complained about it well it was prior to the millennium copyright act yeah 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 Sorry. nobody ever complained about it i mean i guess we were not using it with permission although the funny part was i used uh for the theme song for midnight blue uh, a song called they're playing our song which was from a show called they're playing our song which was written by marvin hamlish and oh, I, I use the music. And uh, one day I get a call. They say, it's Marvin Hamlish's office on the phone. And I'm going, well, let's start getting ready to find another theme song. You know? <laughs> and I get on the line, and uh, it's his secretary. And she says, Mr. Hamlish wanted me to call you and tell you that he was watching Midnight Blue the other night and that you're using his song. They're playing our song uh, on the opening of your show. <coughs> And I said, yeah. And he said, he wants you to know that you have his permission to use it because he loves oh, wow. the program. That's for you. Wow. Uh, That's cool. Yeah. 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 So, so from then on, we had the right to play. They're playing our song. But he was watching the show, though, Alex, which is really cool. Oh, yeah. Well, every, yeah. Every, everybody watched <laughs> it. Everybody watched Midnight <laughs> yeah, Blue. That yeah. was the most popular <laughs> program ever in the history of early cable. You know. Yes, Jeff. I, I thought you could only watch it in New York. Yeah, you only could you watch it in New York. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was I it. I only yeah. watch it when I, I, had a, I had a meeting in New York and I stayed at the hotel and then I could watch it. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that was later on, I think. We were in hotels, though, yeah. Uh, we were in a lot of the hotels. And uh, uh, we even had bars playing it. We had signs. In fact, I have one up here. If you look. It says uh, America's most talked about cable TV show Midnight Blue shown here at midnight. You know, hmm. so we we had bars uh, using is showing it and so on. But then we tried to we tried to get out of New York. We tried Chicago because uh, uh, Warner Warner Cable uh, had a system. This was before they were in Manhattan called the Cube System. It was a really advanced cable system in which you could order up a lot more channels and movies and things like that. We tried to sell it to them, but uh, they, they, that was a no-go. And yet Midnight Blue, for all that it had a, uh, was notorious, had no, today would not even be considered even vaguely notorious. I mean, compared to what they do on HBO or Showtime, you know, <laughs> Midnight Blue was really, really tame. You know, and yet it was Time Warner that tried to close us down and take us off of their system. And it was Time Warner later on who started doing all these fucking sex shows on HBO. 
I mean, you remember I, 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 I have a, I have a promo that somebody made up a funny little fake promo, and it you in fact you can go onto YouTube and watch it, and it's hilarious. <laughs> and the whole thing about it is uh, somebody saying, "Mom, Dad, uh, listen, uh, I, uh, I I just got this uh, this part," and they went, "Oh, what is it?" Well, I play this gay guy, and I'm completely naked, and this guy is caressing my body. And she said, and, and mother says, you're doing porn? And he goes, it's not porn. It's HBO. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then there are a whole bunch of things with people going, and I'm playing this girl, who blah, 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 blah. And then the, the, he has sex with me. You're, you're doing porn? No, I'm doing HBO. It's not porn. And the whole, the whole, then the end, the, the sign says, it's not porn, it's HBO. Uh, and um, it just seems kind of weird to me that the very people who kind of killed our buzz with, Mid with Midnight Blue were the same people who later on would run HBO, right? Time Life. And uh, would run HBO and, and, and do exactly what we were doing, but more. You know, they, they, this is a show on now that just started up called uh, the, uh, what's it called? The something or another. It's all about New York City and porn and... Uh, oh, the dude. The, the what? The dude? What, the, what's, what's it called? The deuce. The, the deuce. The deuce. Exactly. Yeah, I messaged you about it. Yeah. Oh, and, 45 uh, minutes after the hour. Yeah. And if you if you look at it, it there, there are penises galore in this show. Now I got I got to tell you well wait, let me finish That's something a Delore. So while we're talking about penises, one of the things I saw on this retrospect there was a thing I shot with Marilyn Chambers and a black guy. He was naked, she was naked. And they were dancing, doing a a a, a kind of semi ballet whatever dance and um she that uh, we, we then the cable company always got our tapes ahead of time and and said well they called me up and said uh, we can't play this week's show unless you take out that Marilyn Chambers segment and I said why and they said because uh, she's dancing with a black guy and his penis is bobbing up and down <laughs> <laughs> and I said. Bobbing up and down, huh? Now, wait a minute. Is this the same tape where her tits are flopping up and down? They said, yeah, the very same, but that doesn't matter. His penis is flopping up and down. And I went, isn't this sexist of you to decide that a man's penis can't flop around, but a woman's tits can? And they gave in to me. Because I threatened that I was going to, like, do some kind of, like, civil suit against them about male rights I say he's not doing anything horrible he's just dancing and he has this appendage that can't help but flop up and down yeah but you couldn't put a shadow over it no I, I don't want to do that if I've got her tits bouncing up and down god damn it he has the right to have his cock bouncing up and down <laughs> equal opportunity yeah. what were you going to say Tony on a personal, did your mom ever get mad? Like when she saw the show, like did she get worried? Like, oh, Alex, what are you doing? Like my mother would get mad if I was out late. Really? My, my mother, get, like, my, upset my like, mother, I don't read. think my mother, I don't think ever saw Midnight Blue. Oh, okay. Okay. You think she'd be bothered if she saw that though? Like, what is he doing? Uh, she's. My mother would be bothered by anything. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll she's tell you. Mother. I'll tell you the uh, the. Uh, uh, my mother came to visit for about two or three weeks, which is. Absolutely yeah. grueling if you if you really like having a sex life, okay? Because you it's kind of hard to fuck with your mother around, you know. And she can make you breakfast or something like that. <laughs> no, so I I would bring women over and they would they would stay with me in the bedroom. My mother slept on the couch, uh, and, uh, and my mom wasn't going to sleep with me. And we did whatever we we're going to do silently. You no, know, shh, mom's in the other room, right? Felt like I was a kid again. Uh, and um, so finally, it's the end of my mother's stay at in, in New York with me. And she says, you know, I don't like the women you're seeing. 
I said, I don't like the women you're seeing. I said, well, uh, how about so-and-so? And, -and, -so? and uh, her, her last name was Bergman. And she said, I don't like her. She, I don't like her at all. And I said, well, you do know she's a uh, graphic artist. Uh, she does uh, wonderful, um, sp what, what, when they spray the paint, what's it called? Uh, airbrush. Air airbrush stuff. Oh. She did airbrush stuff for covers of books and things like that. And, and she's the, the, the uh, niece of the Bergmans who wrote The Way They Were and songs like that. Oh. And she said, I still don't like her. I said, I said, did any of the women, did any of the women that I introduced you to, did you like any of them? He said, well, I like that Rhoda. She was really nice. And I said, really? He said, yeah, I liked her a lot. And I she said, was well, married. I said, mom, do you know what Rhoda does for a living? And she says, no, what? I said, she's a porn actress. Well, after I got through taking my mother's tongue out of her throat and putting a stick in her mouth so she wouldn't swallow it again i said you just know judge a character mom <laughs> let's face it yes patrick hey tony tony oh yeah at at some point you just have to say you don't give a shit what your mother thinks yeah i mean we, we all reach that point at some <laughs> point in our life that we go i don't really give a shit what my mom thinks so maybe like you're not. I, told her I put her numbers in. I lie to her sometimes, but I don't put them in anymore. Uh, his his mother is his landlord. Yeah. I was going to say uh, when you're living with her, yeah, that's a little different yeah, story. Yeah. I hear her because I hear when she gets up, she gets a cane. I can hear her walking across the. Here she goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you can bring home me, any. Chips. But I I agree with you. I agree with you, Patrick. There's a point in your life when you just have to say, I don't care what my mother thinks. Here my now. mother's going to be 90 in December. And she still calls me and says, did you brush your teeth? And uh, are you wearing a sweater? <laughs> really? I did she also you tell you, Phil? I did she also that. tell you, though, uh, wear clean underwear also? By the uh, way, by the way, at the last moment, because of Brian calling at the last moment, we have a full house tonight. Bravo, everybody. Yay. Yay. Can you hear me? Huh? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah. A different uh, room, different computer, same uh, type of microphone, same type of camera, just connected to a different machine. Oh. So I was just wondering. Well, that's, that's, that's terrific. <laughs> you know, but uh, anyway, so, you know, Midnight Blue was, uh, it was quite a, quite a thing, you know. It was, uh, I, if people say to me, every now and then people would come up to me and go, oh, I know what you did. You did Midnight Blue in New York. <laughs> And I went, yeah. So, and they go, why? No. You, you want you don't, you don't want anybody to know that, do you? And I said, I want the whole world to know it. I said, it's one of my finest accomplishments. I mean, uh, the only episode I ever saw was the one you showed me uh, called the Spermathon. Oh, well, that yeah, that was where I got this idea <laughs> to, <laughs> to see how many guys one woman could fuck in the night. <laughs> And we got volunteers from the we got volunteers from the audience who wrote in who wanted to be a part of the spermathon, and they all came down. And her name was Tara Alexander, and she did seventy five guys in one night. I figured I'd been watching I'd been watching Caligula on PBS, and uh, you know the woman what's her name I can't remember Messalina I think was her name. She went and fucked like half the Roman army one night in an orgy. She had all these guys one after the other fucking her. And I wanted to see if we could beat Messalina's record, which I think was something like 50. Okay. So yeah, this gal had like uh, three or four at a time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And they were all very respectful. They all wanted her to do well. I mean, it was a great, it was a great, uh, I've actually had, I actually had uh, sociologists come in and watch the tapes. They were that interested in the dynamics of the whole process. But the fact that I <laughs> thought, funny or so they were, well, the, the, the fact that I thought that thing up shows how sick I am, you know, <laughs> that, that I wouldn't have told my mother about. Okay. I just want to know if she walked funny or if she sat right. Uh, uh, well, she uh, she was laying there most of the time. She no, she survived it very nicely. You know, um, it was. Uh, uh, but that that was the only tape I had that I showed you. They, they, yeah, it was the only one you had. Actually, you made a copy of it for me, I, but I don't know what I. Did I with don't it. really have many tape. I don't have any tapes of Midnight Blue. Really, I, that's why I saw this thing online, 
and uh, now I have a copy of it. And yeah. John Rockwell says he's got some tapes, but he's having a hard time getting them dubbed off because, you know, these things were done on three-quarter inch tape, and it's very hard, number one, to get a place to do that. Uh, well, the, the one that you showed me, Spermathon, was on VHS. Yeah. So maybe it's still in your storage. Could be. I don't remember having a copy of it, to be honest. Well, yeah, because you. you dubbed the copy off for me. Yeah. Now, Anne Rhinestone, the woman who I inherited the photography from, which is still in probate, and who knows what's happening with it, I think somewhere had tapes of, and we might be in possession of them, tapes of Midnight Blue. But John mm -hmm. Rockwell has some, you know... Um, but I can I can go online and get a lot of it because this guy put out like seven or eight volumes of Midnight Blue stuff, a lot of which, you know, I shot and did. So, you know, what the hell, you know. Get it restored and release it as a DVD set and get some money you, for it. You know out. something, the trouble is that we recorded it. What happened was, you know, again, we were talking about this the other night. and, and 55 Rob, Rob, minutes past the hour. All right, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Rob, uh, uh, Rob may remember this because he did TV. In those days, you didn't have digital. You had tape. So if you were going to make an edited tape, you were literally recording a piece of tape onto a tape. And so it was losing one generation. generation. Right. And so when Midnight Blue finally got on the air, what people were watching in the final production was of a second generation a second generation right second the, generation i couldn't tell over the the uh the sneezing or the <laughs> nose blowing yeah who just blew his nose by the way that would be me. not me huh that was me uh, that was you that was a good one uh because anything that can stop me uh anyway uh, the, the point is that it, you're right uh it was um uh, uh, it, it, but you had it, so that if we then made another copy of it for people to take, watch at home, that's a third generation. Every time yeah, you went down a generation, especially with that stuff, you lost quality. So yeah. the stuff that you even can especially get, especially on three quarter inch. Yeah, well, the stuff you can buy today of Midnight Blue, which you can go to go to Amazon. It's on Amazon. Uh, I should order them just so I have a copy of them and I can make stuff out of them. But anyway. Uh, those tapes are really not very good quality. Uh, in fact, the beginning of this thing says, uh, this was recorded, blah, 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 three-quarter inch tape, uh, you know, and the quality wasn't that good, but we've done everything we can to restore it, which doesn't look like they did anything. And, and then you always see says, the head switching and, down And then the I, got, I got upset because the next line was, and besides, you can't shine shit. Uh, and I got a little mad at that. You know, we were the polished turd is a polished well, turd. We had the best quality we could get out of that equipment at the time. But I'll tell you one thing about it being like third generation, fourth generation, it got so blurry that really you created you know, you you you, you had to you had to fill in the blanks with your brain. You know, so now that everything's so clean and clear, porn isn't fun anymore. It was much more fun when it was an eight millimeter film and it was scratchy and you had to like fill in the s scratch marks in your brain. It was more fun when you used to have to watch it all scrambled on your TV. Oh, oh back yeah, yeah. And forth. I, I, call that, I call that Picasso porn, <laughs> you, you know, uh, because. It, like, oh, there it is. I could see. There's a boob. They scrambled all the channels. And it was yeah. awesome. 57 minutes past the hour, oh, Gabnet, New York. Oh, shut up, Phil. <laughs> you know, you take your job a little too seriously yeah. here, Phil. All I wanted to know was when I should get off so that... Uh, oh, 58 minutes. Well, it, it's 58 up, minutes and, and 9 seconds. Actually, if I look back at my new cable box, yeah, I have the time there. So, Ooh. you know. All right, How's I'm fired. How's I've that? been replaced by a cable the, box. You figure with the scrambled porn... <laughs> Figured with the scrambled porn, you're wondering if that's a pubic hair or an errant uh, uh, nostril hair or facial hair. Yeah, but it was midnight blue, and you never saw spermatozoa. Hmm. So I don't know why I said that. It's a part of my life I'm very proud of. And you know, the funny thing was when I did my life story, 
I don't think I ever talked about my father's dying. I don't think I even mentioned it. Well, now you got a job. You need now to I want to know why I spent three weeks talking, uh, three episodes talking about Midnight Blue, and not ten seconds on my father dying. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna have. I really do have to go to a shrink. It's very, very important. <laughs> anyway, go back and edit it in or something. No? Huh? Yeah. You record it and. Uh... You know, I just have an addendum. Yeah, just you're like blah 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 blah. By the way, my father died. Blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> and just cut it right in. And because it's digital, the quality will be pristine. Anyway, oh. hey, say good night to Rob. Good night. Good night uh, to you, Phil. Good night. You're not here tomorrow night, right? No. Phil uh, free I, night. I oh, mean yay! That means the whole world yay. will be the Phil free Friday. 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 We'll, we'll, we'll be the path to our doorstep. Yes, thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Kevin, for joining us this evening. Uh, 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 Brian, always nice to see you, you fine fellow. Uh, Mike, nice to have you here. Patrick, always a pleasure. Tony, always a pleasure. And Diane, a rare pleasure that you have have graced us this evening. Thank you, everybody. Wave goodbye, would you? Okay, bye-bye. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And that's it for tonight. Uh, uh, Let me just hang up on everybody. Oh, what do you know? Uh, Skype is saying, how would you rate the overall quality of this video call? I I will go, excellent. Okay, fine. Because it did look good tonight. Uh, They didn't exactly suck. Anyway, that's it for tonight. Uh, stay tuned now for uh, Jack and Amy. They do a little thing called The Intersection. And uh, after that, at uh, 1 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, it's Connections. Uh, and I will see you again tomorrow night, same time, same station in life. And as always, and very particularly tonight, because she puts up with so much, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Bye. Bye.